Welcome to MA3D1, the Warwick Maths module on fluid dynamics. This video is about steady one dimensional flows. So let's see what they are. The definition of one dimensionality in this case is the situation when we have flow of a fluid along one coordinate direction, be it Cartesian coordinates or cylindrical coordinates but that the flow varies with a perpendicular coordinate or along a perpendicular coordinate. So here is one example. The first example we will consider is flow between two flat walls shown in black. And let's imagine this sort of a profile of flow being developed. All the flow is purely along the direction parallel to the walls which we call x, uh, the x-axis, and the flow velocity only varies with distance from the center plane of the gap. Uh, so we call that coordinate y. So we only have u as a function of y in this case. Another example could be flow between two cylinders. There is an outer cylinder here, and there's an inner cylinder, the axial coordinate we'll call z and the radial coordinate is r. So we can have the flow along the axial direction like uh, as shown in uh, by these arrows, but it changes along with, uh, along with the radial coordinate only. So in this case, we have w as a function of r. And the final situation or case we would like to consider is the flow in an annulus again between two cylinders, two infinite cylinders, but in this case the flow is along the theta direction or parallel to the walls of the cylinder along, uh, along the azimuthal direction and it varies only along the radial coordinate r. The first situation is called plain Couet Poisset flow, the second one is called cylindrical Couet Poisset flow. The difference being the first one, the, the one uh, called plane is in Cartesian coordinates. The one called cylindrical is in cylindrical coordinates. And the third situation has a name circular Couette flow. Okay. So these are the, these are roughly the three types of uh, one dimensional flows you will see. Uh, sometimes it's also worthwhile considering situations in which the top wall is not actually a solid wall but it could be a free interface like flow down and incline or something like that with uh, the top surface being open to the atmosphere. You will notice one important property of these flows is that the acceleration of the fluid along the flow direction vanishes. And it does so because, let's consider the, the first example, the plane Couette Poisset flow. Because the fluid flows along x, but does not change along x, that means if you consider any fluid particle, it's moving at a constant speed along the same direction the whole time, and therefore is not accelerating. The situation is uh, similar for cylindrical Couette flow and is only slightly different from uh, for circular Couette flow. In this case, the fluid flows along a circle with a constant speed, and therefore its acceleration is uh, centripetal towards the center of that circle, which is perpendicular to the direction of the flow at every instance. So let's now consider what sort of situation could give rise to a flow that will be one dimensional. In other words, why is there a flow? What agency is causing the flow? What agency is pushing the fluid uh, to flow? And there are three main agencies that we must consider. The first one is a body force, second one is a pressure gradient, and third is motion of walls. Now, for the flow to be one-dimensional, which means the flow to be uniform along the direction of the flow, we would want uh, 
either the body force or the pressure gradient or the motion along walls, any of these three quantities which I'm claiming is driving the flow to be uniform along that direction. Okay, so which means these, this forcing uh, cannot change with the direction of the flow. Okay. Uh, let's now consider each one of them uh, in turn. So the body force G, um, this is as we know in the Navier-Stokes equations, it is the force per unit volume exerted on the fluid by an external agency. And you can imagine if gravity is pointing this way, which means I have drawn, I've rotated my head so that the x-axis is actually pointing downwards, then the weight of the fluid itself could be driving the flow through the gap. That's one example. Similarly, in this situation, the weight of the fluid could be driving the flow through this gap. The second situation is that of pressure gradient. Um, the way flow is driven by pressure gradient is imagine upstream here of a very long channel. You have something like a pump that raises the pressure of the upstream fluid and this increased pressure drives the flow to flow uh, the fluid to flow through the gap that situation it would be considered as flow driven by a pressure gradient and finally flow driven by motion of walls in this case i have shown maybe there is neither gravity nor pressure gradient but if one of the walls moves relative to the other we have seen this situation uh, when we discussed the newtonian setup then you can have a flow set up in the fluid, not the one that I've drawn, a different one, but a flow, one dimensional flow, nevertheless. The way these driving forces appear in the governing Navier-Stokes equation is as follows. So here I have written the momentum balance for the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, and if you have a non-zero body force term, then that would appear here. And that would be considered as a, <coughs> excuse me, as a inhomogeneity in this equation, which drives the variable u. Similarly, if you have a pressure gradient that is non-zero, then you will notice it plays uh, the same role as uh, a body force does. So, in that sense, the effect of these two forcings of pressure gradient and gravity are closely analogous to each other. And the way motion of walls works is that we have a second order differential equation for the velocity. We are going to need boundary conditions. And if we have non-homogeneous boundary conditions, then the solution to those equations will depend on those boundary conditions in some way. And the flow that results from those boundary conditions will be flow because of the motion of walls. We are going to consider two special cases, although you should be able to solve uh, any other cases of one dimensional flow once you go through uh, and study this chapter. All right? And these two cases are, will help you get there. The first one we will consider is plain Poisson flow and I'll specifically mention that it will be driven by a pressure gradient. Now usually I prepare the handwritten notes that I will use for the lecture but for this situation I'm going to develop them as I deliver the lecture and it's and I want you to work this example out with me. This is so exa uh, important that I really want you to take the time to work it out with, with me. This could easily be one of the exam problems. So let's start with uh, uh, conservation of mass. Let's write the Navier-Stokes equations in Cartesian coordinates in two dimensions. And conservation of momentum along the x-direction first 
rho times del u del t plus u del u del x plus v del u del y equals minus del p del x this is the pressure gradient plus rho g x plus mu del 2 u del x squared plus del 2 u del y squared and the momentum balance along y direction rho del v del t plus u del v del x plus v del v del y equals minus del p del y plus rho g y plus mu del 2 v del x square plus del 2 v del y square okay so there we have it i hope you take a moment to write these equations yourself and work out this problem with me right now the particular flow that we are going to look for will have this form u equals u of y v equals zero and we don't know what sort what to expect for the pressure but we know that there is no gravity so gx equals gy equals zero there is no body force because i have stated explicitly that the flow is driven by pressure gradient but you will immediately see that uh, gravity is not going to the fact that if gravity were non-zero, you could have easily incorporated it. So now let's see what happens to this equation. I'm going to use a different colored pen. U is a function of y, so del u del x is zero. V is zero, so del v del y is zero. And this equation is satisfied. And you should not be surprised at all because you s the way you set up the flow, you will see, if I go back here for a moment, all the fluid that crosses one cross section pushes the fluid at the next cross section because that fluid is also moving in an identical way. And therefore, there is no possibility of uh, mass being accumulated anywhere. Therefore, the divergence of this, of this velocity field will automatically turn out to be zero, which is what we have here. Uh, I should introduce a little bit of space. So I want to write something here. The next thing you will notice is that because this is steady flow, these terms are zero. Because u is not a function of x, this term is zero. Because v is zero, that term is zero. Because v is zero, those two terms are zero too. And that's what I meant by the inertial term or the fluid acceleration equals zero. And therefore, the inertial term in the Navier-Stokes equations automatically turn out to be zero. We are given that gravity isn't present, so no body force, that term is zero. In addition, in the y-momentum equation, we know that v is zero. That means the two viscous terms in the y-momentum equation are zero. We know u is a function of y alone, so one of the two viscous terms in the x-momentum equation is also zero. And we are left with an incredibly simple system which says dp dx equals mu del 2u del y squared and dp dy equals zero. In other words, p is a function of x alone. Does not vary with y. So we could have change this into a total derivative if we want. Now here we have a situation which is uh, um, not uncommon. Here on the left hand side we have a function that depends on x alone if at all and on the right hand side we have a function that depends on y alone which means when you change y, the right hand side can change, but the left hand side cannot. And therefore, the, le the both sides must be a constant. And there is a way to interpret this. Remember 
we said we are going to get one dimensional flow when the different points along the direction of the flow, in this case along x, are all identical to each other. The fluid dynamics at any location x is identical to the fluid dynamics at a different location x. And therefore nothing can depend on x. And that's why we have a uniform flow in x. Now by uniform I mean a flow that does not depend on x. And that's what we are seeing here in this reflected in this equation. This equation says that dp dx and mu d to u dy squared both must be a constant. So I will call it lambda. But I don't need to call it lambda. What I can do is simply use dp dx as the value for that constant, which means the pressure gradient is a constant. Now, if the flow is driven by pressure gradient, then we will have pressure higher on the upstream side, lower on the downstream side. And what the, this final result says, that the rate at which pressure drops must be uniform. And that is why one gets that the flow that develops in the fluid is also constant in X, which means it doesn't change with X because the driving agency, the gradient of pressure, is acting, is somehow distributed uniformly throughout this fluid. Okay. And now you will see how the influence of gravity and the influence of pressure gradient are an closely analogous to each other. If we had a constant component of gravity acting along the flow, then all that would have done is change this constant to also include the force due to gravity. So I'm not going to call this a, la a constant uh, lambda because I don't need another symbol. I can integrate this equation twice to get mu del u del y equals y dp dx plus a and mu times u is y squared over two dp dx plus a y plus b where a and b are constants of integration i need to now satisfy two boundary conditions because this is uh, like a second order differential equation for u as a function of y second order ordinary differential equation for u as a function of y and here is the solution. Here is the general solution of the ODE. Now what I need to do is substitute boundary conditions. And because I have solid walls on both sides of the fluid uh, layer, my boundary conditions are that of no slip. U at y equals plus or minus h over 2 equals 0, which means on the two walls, the walls are static and therefore the fluid sticks to the wall and has a velocity of 0. And you can solve now two equations in the two unknowns, which are the constants of integration a and b, but I would invite you to learn how to do this simply by inspection. I will tell you how I do it. dp dx y square minus h square over 4. So how did I do this? I noticed that I have a quadratic. I can choose the constant and the linear term and I want to satisfy a zero condition at uh, h plus or minus h over 2. And the only quadratic that does that is if I had something proportional to y squared minus h squared over 4. So I notice that my constant b must be dp dx times minus h squared over 4. And my constant a must be 0. And uh, this quadratic now satisfies both my boundary conditions. Oh, I uh, have a factor of 2 that is missing. And therefore, u of y is 1 over 2 mu dp dx 
y squared minus h squared over 4 is my fluid velocity and it's, if I plot this you will notice that it will look parabolic like that right. now let's uh, while we are at it let's also analyze some of the properties of this flow what is the maximum speed we get so here we have u max is the maximum speed it happens it occurs at y equals 0 and is equal to minus 1 over 2 mu dp dx times h squared over 4 and note that dp dx here which is the pressure gradient is negative if you want a flow that is along the positive uh, x-axis because we want the pressure to be decreasing in the direction of the flow similarly it is also customary to look at the average velocity average speed of the fluid and you arrive at this by taking u of y integrating it across the layer h over 2 to h over 2 and then dividing it by the thickness of the layer right. this is the average speed the average speed multiplied by the thickness should give you the a volumetric flow rate across any cross section in the flow if i do this integral you can see what i'm going to get i have 1 over h then i have 1 over 2 mu dp dx and the integral of y squared is y cubed over 3 minus y h squared over 4 evaluated at minus h over 2 to h over 2. If I do this integral, I get 1 over 12 mu minus dp dx times h squared. And uh, this is a well-known fact and so i feel obligated in mentioning this is that the average speed turns out to be two-thirds of the maximum speed which happens along the center line for this flow so now you see how this flow uh, is developed now, if you want it you can now go ahead and calculate uh, the stress we have the pressure we also have uh, the velocity so we can differentiate it to find the viscous stress and find the force of drag on the walls i'm not going to do that here but uh, maybe we'll do it in a later video but this is a good time for you to try your skills if you understood uh, how to calculate forces and attempt. The next flow we are going to see is called Hagen Fosse flow. Uh, and this is uh, uh, in cylindrical coordinates driven by pressure gradient this is the situation in which you have a cylinder an outer cylinder but no inner cylinder and the flow that sets up the cylinder itself is stationary the fluid pressure is high upstream and therefore the flow that sets up has this sort of profile the flow is fastest near the center line I'm going to call the center line the axis of the cylinder as the Z axis and I have the R axis uh, along the radius and we have a velocity which is purely 
along the axial direction but varies along the radial direction and that's why this is a one dimensional flow. The question is to solve for this velocity profile. Okay. If you follow the same process in cylindrical coordinates this time, instead of Cartesian coordinates, the momentum balance in the Navier-Stokes equation simplifies to, let me use a blue pen for this, dp dr equals zero, which means pressure doesn't vary along r, and dp dz equals mu over r del del r of r times dw dr. Now I can write these derivatives as total derivatives because w is a function only of r and pressure does not change with r so pressure is a function only of z so by the same logic we have both these equal to a constant and I'm going to just refer to that constant by dpdz, the pressure gradient, the axial pressure gradient. And I do the same process. Mm. Now, one thing I would like to point out here is if you follow the version of Navier-Stokes equations in cylindrical coordinates that I've given you in the notes, the solution of this equation becomes much easier. If you follow something like Wikipedia, it may or may not be easier. Different sources express the equations differently. If you follow my notes, the solution of this equation for W of R is supposed to work like this. dp dz is a constant, so I take R and mu on the other side and I get del del R of R del W del R equals R over mu dp dz actually let me write these as total derivatives d dr dw dr now i can integrate this once so i get r dw dr equals r squared over 2 mu dp dz plus a constant a and now this is worth this expression is worth noting because it has information that I'm going to use later then I find dw dr by dividing by r r over 2 mu dp dz plus a over r and I integrate again to find w of r r over 2 mu r squared over 4 mu that would be the integral dp dz plus a log r plus b and uh, the boundary conditions now we use to find a and b Ooh, I should use no slip boundary condition but it so happens that uh, we only have the wall at the radius of the the inner radius of the pipe w r of r is 0 where this is r and now that means we have only one condition we don't have two conditions and it is customary at this point to claim that uh, well if you substitute r equals 0 the center line this term blows up log r goes to infinity to minus infinity and we don't have any sort of any blow up of this sort in the physical fluid possible so we are just going to set a equal to zero and we are going to deduce b from this one boundary condition that we have now this requires a little thought because later in this module we are going to let velocity blow up at some points on some axes etc so what exactly are we saying by imposing that oh our velocity in this case does not blow up at r equals zero now i will bring you back to this expression that we derived that i asked you to note if i multiply this by mu uh, i have mu r dw dr equals r squared over 2 mu dp 
dz plus a mu and what this expression on the left hand side is is as follows if i pick an imaginary cylinder so i'm going to draw it in green this is an imaginary surface of a cylinder of some length l then the shear force the force of friction exerted by the fluid outside on the fluid inside is going to be given by the integral of sigma r dub r z sigma r z right uh, times d a on the boundary of this uh, cylinder and this sigma r a sigma r z on the boundary of this cylinder will be uh, we will need to integrate in theta but everything is uniform in theta axisymmetry and we will need to integrate in z but everything is also uniform in z and therefore we will be left with sigma r z is equal to mu dw dr times the area uh, r d theta right? so i should actually have written the uh, the area element as r d theta over there so this the integral in theta is from 0 to 2 pi the integral in l is 0 to l and this factor of r times dw dr times mu is nothing but this quantity according to our solution so now i'm going to change the color to blue so this is the force that i am computing equals integral i can actually do these integrals now integral of d theta will give me 2 pi integral of dz will give me l and mu dw dr times r is equal to r squared over 2 mu dp dz plus a mu Sorry, no, I should have not had this mu there to begin with. Okay. So what I have calculated in this expression is the force on the walls of this cylinder. Right? As a function of the radius of this cylinder. Because you see R enters there. Now I will consider the limit as R goes to 0 of the force. In other words... I'm calculating the force exerted by the fluid on the axis, on the axis of the cylinder, on an infinite cylinder, uh, cylinder of infinite cylinder radius on the axis. And I get 2 pi L times A mu. Now, because we don't have any physical agency that is exerting a force on the axis, we don't expect this force to be non-zero. And yet, we found the force to be proportional to A. We should set this force equal to zero because no physical agency is exerting this force. And therefore, our constant A will be zero. Once A is 0, now it is uh, easy to find B to satisfy the no-slip condition. We have W of R is dp dz over 4 mu R squared minus R squared. Right. And that is our velocity field inside the pipe. Here again, we can find the maximum velocity. W max happens at the center. 1 over 4 mu dp dz negative sign r squared. And we can find the average velocity is 1 over 2 pi r, which is the area of the cross section, 0 to r, 2 pi r dr that's the area 
that's the area of the uh, of a tiny sliver at radius r times w of r and if i substitute this what do i get uh, pi r oh sorry i made a mistake it should be the area of cross section not the perimeter so this should be pi r square and i get pi r square if i do this i get r squared over 8 mu sorry no pi r squared over 8 mu dp dz with a minus sign and by comparing the average velocity with the maximum velocity you will notice that the average velocity through the pipe is equal to one half the maximum velocity which happens at the center of the pipe so this is another um, of the uh, of the well-known results uh, now what i have already done here is found the force along or uh, acting on any imaginary cylinder i would like you to go ahead and evaluate this expression uh, after substituting a equals zero on the walls of the cylinder because i think in the next chapter we are going to we are going to use that right so i want you to take a cylinder of the same size as uh, the outer cylinder and find the force on the walls of the cylinder So that concludes this section on steady one-dimensional flows. Uh, there will be other problems that I will post in the e example sheet which will allow you to practice problems like these uh, by yourself. So thank you for your attention and I hope to see you in the next video.